Welcome. Uh, my name is Larry Hoffheimer, and I am the founder and chairman of the Macular Regeneration Association. Uh, we serve the macular patient community with about as much information as we can, possibly can about AMD, which is sure many of you know is actually, a, I hate to use the word, uh, epidemic proportions. Uh, it it's, affects uh, so many people uh, over the age of 60, and there's uh, an awful lot of activity in as far as research and development in this area. Uh, but one of the things we like to do is put on these virtual seminars, which we intend to uh, continue uh, certainly for the rest of the year. But I want to thank our, our sponsors, both Regeneron and Novartis, for their support in these virtual programs, as well as Notovision uh, for their additional sponsorship. And you'll hear from them later. We got two great speakers today that are going to present. Uh, Dr. Jeremiah Brown is a distinguished member uh, of the Macro Regeneration Association Board. Uh, he's also a board certified ophthalmologist with more than 10 years of practice and experience as a vector retinal surgeon. He founded the Brown Retina Institute in 2010 to establish a medical practice devoted to diagnosing, treating, and researching diseases of the retina. Uh, Dr. Brown also holds an academic appointment at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. Dr. Brown's Retina Institute is located, has two locations in, in San Antonio. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome my friend, uh, Dr. Jeremiah Brown. Well, thank you very much, Larry. Uh, I really enjoy doing these presentations. Um, it gives me a chance to spend the time that we don't necessarily get when we're in the office. And we can go a little bit deeper into what's actually happening in the disease of macular degeneration. In our first webinar that we talked, uh, that I talked with you, um, we talked about macular degeneration, what causes it, what are the treatments that are available, how we evolved from where we started to where we are now, and um, we kind of really went in depth. And just as a brief review for maybe some of those who did not see that, we're just gonna take about five minutes just to kind of review the highlights. And the first thing to mention is that the first thing that starts to develop in the eye are these little protein deposits that we call drusen. These are proteins, you can see these little yellow speckles throughout the, the area of the retina here. This image that you're looking at is showing the optic nerve, it's showing the retinal blood vessels, and it's showing the macula. The macula is the center part of the retina that does your central vision. And you can see all these little yellow speckled dots. Those are the drusen. These are protein deposits, proteins that are building up in the retina that shouldn't be there and they cause the retina to start to malfunction. One of the things that can happen is abnormal blood vessels can grow. These blood vessels grow into the retina, they leak, they bleed, and that can very dramatically change a person's vision. Out of all the people with macular degeneration, about one in every seven develops the wet form where their blood vessels growing in. And this can change someone's vision just from one month to the next. Whereas the little deposits, they will slowly progress over years. And so someone may have been told that they had signs of macular degeneration 15 or 20 years ago, but they're still seeing 2020 because these deposits just slowly progress over the years. Whereas with the wet form, when we see blood vessels growing in the retina, this can change someone's vision in just a month or two. One of the tests that you'll have done at your ophthalmology office is called an OCT scan. It's a, it's a laser based scan. The light is going into the eye and bouncing off the retina and giving a view of the contour of the retina. And you can see in this image, this uh, upper part of the screen right here is what's in the eye. This is the retina, these green striped layers going across like this is the retina. And then there's this layer, this bright orange red layer here. And these are cells, they're called the retinal pigmented epithelial cells. These are cells that are 
a natural barrier. They nourish the retina, they give the retina uh, nutrients, recycles things from the retina and sends them back. Very, very important layer. And it's also a barrier between what's underneath here. You can see these little round circles. These are choroidal blood vessels, blood vessels under the retina in a place called the choroid. And that's where these abnormal blood vessels develop and grow up into the retina that cause that wet form. So let's say someone came in noticing new distortion in their vision and they had their scan and their scan looked like this. So immediately you can tell there's something wrong here. That orangey red layer looks pretty good over here. And then as we go more toward the center of the diagram, we see a lump, a distortion. We see some dark areas here underneath the retina. The retina is kind of ballooned up over here. This is, this is because there are abnormal blood vessels growing from this deeper layer into the retina. Now, when this happens, this is what it looks like when someone has the wet form. All of our treatments that we are doing to try to stop the wet form involve stopping the growth of these abnormal blood vessels. Now, the big, big advance happened when we learned that there's a chemical and it's an amazing story. It actually goes back to a doctor named Judah Folkman who had an idea that there must be some kind of signal that can make blood vessels grow. And he was thinking about it in terms of cancer because in cancer cells, a tumor can keep growing larger and larger and larger, but if it doesn't have blood flow, that tumor is gonna stop. It's just gonna stop growing because it can't get any more oxygen. So he figured there must be a chemical that causes blood vessels to grow that the tumor is using this chemical to feed the tumor. So through years of research, they under, understood and learned that there's a chemical called vascular endothelial growth factor. It's a growth factor, it makes things grow. And in this case, it's making blood vessels grow. And then we learned that in the eye, that same chemical is important. It's a chemical that makes blood vessels grow. So in macular degeneration, the retina starts sending out this signal, causing abnormal blood vessels to grow. It's thought that because the retina is not getting enough oxygen because of all these proteins, I mean, all those little yellow proteins depositing in the retina, that yellow protein deposit material is causing or blocking the oxygen from getting to the retina. So the retina is sending out a signal saying, hey, we need more oxygen up here. So these blood vessels start growing up from that deeper layer. Well, the age of VEGF for macular degeneration started in 2005 when we had the first medication that could block that chemical. It basically just binds it. And that medication was called Macugen. And then from there, things evolved, Lucentis, Avastin, Ilea. We talked about this in detail in the first, first presentation. That brought us up to where we are now. And, and we're gonna be going from this further as we talk further. So just some of the take home points we had from that first presentation is remembering that there's a difference between wet and dry. You can have dry macular degeneration where you just have those little deposits that can be in one eye and the other eye can be wet. You could be dry macular degeneration for 15 or 20 years and then all of a sudden it can turn to be wet. Or some people are actually diagnosed on their first visit with having the wet form with bleeding. So it's very, very much a uh, a variety of how people present with this condition. And why is that? And that is because there are multiple genes, as well as whether or not you smoke, as well as what your diet is. All of these things contribute to your risk for macular degeneration. And as we discussed, everyone's macular degeneration is not the same. There are multiple genes. You might've inherited two genes that give you more risk, but you also inherited a third gene that lowers your risk. You might have inherited six genes that all give you more increased risk. And so every person who has macular degeneration has the combination of these different gene changes that increase their risk or lower their risk for macular degeneration. And all of these things are gonna influence whether you present when you're in your 60s and that's when you first have wet AMD or whether you present in your 80s when you have your first form of AMD. Some of it is genetic and we can't change that. But the things that we can change, like you see on this diagram, is the food that we eat. So by eating more greens, 
by as particularly the leafy greens like spinach and kale, by having fish once or twice a week, by taking the AREDS vitamins. We talked about that in detail about how the AREDS two vitamins will lower your risk of progression, slows it down, basically slowing down the rate of progression of macular degeneration. By doing things, these are things that we can control. And by not smoking, those things will lower your risk. And then when you do turn to that wet form, these medications that we have available to stop the wet form, which are blocking the chemical called vascular endothelial growth factor. It's just a growth factor that makes blood vessels grow. And if you put something in the eye that can block that chemical and bind it, the blood vessels stop growing. It's, it's, all, it's like a miracle to see it when it happens. So now let's go forward. So where do we go forward from where we are now? Now, unfortunately, even people with the dry form can progress to severe vision loss. On these two pictures you're seeing on the left picture is someone who has the dry form. You can see at the edge of this kind of cookie cutter circle, there are some of these little yellow deposits. Those are the drusen. Those are those little yellow deposits that we were talking about earlier. But what's different is in the center, there's a large area where the cells are missing. It almost looks like someone took a cookie cutter and just cut those out and they're missing the cells in this central zone. Anything that they're trying to read, anything that they're looking at, an image, a face, if it falls in this zone, they can't see it. So it's like a blind spot right in their central vision. That's what can happen in the advanced form of the dry macular degeneration. Now in the wet form, we saw that picture of what it looks like when it first starts bleeding and we could see that blood. But what happens actually beyond that is that scar tissue will form. And so this white tissue you see underneath the retina is the scar tissue that forms if you have the wet form and it doesn't get treated. You get the same blind spot in your central vision from the scar tissue. Once it gets to the scar tissue form, there's really not much that can be, do, can be done to help improve your vision. If it's still active and still leaking, maybe we can treat it for a while and stop the active leakage and there may be some improvement, but the scar tissue, we don't have a way to get rid of it. And in fact, we talked in our first um, seminar, we talked about how surgery was one of the things that was tried, going in and removing the scar tissue. And you can do that. You can remove that scar tissue with surgery. The problem is a lot of those healthy RPE cells, those, those helper cells that we talked about, a lot of those come out with it. And so when you take the scar tissue out, you lose a lot of healthy tissue. And so the person still ends up with a blind spot in their central vision. So pretty much our goal is to stop people from getting to this stage. So we spent a lot of time talking about the wet form. I, I wanna talk a little bit about the dry form. This graphic that you see here is only there to let you know how complicated this whole system is. What causes macular degeneration, are one of the causes are changes in genes that are in this pathway of inflammation. These are just proteins and each one of these little circles is a different protein that all interact, that help defend us against inf infection. They cause inflammation. They get the immune system revved up. They help kill invaders. And these are proteins that are in all of our cells in, all, in our bloodstream and they help control inflammation. Well, when you have mutations or changes in these genes, they cause a low grade of inflammation that's going on in the retina that causes or is one of the causes for macular degeneration. So as we started learning these things, I mean, all of this that you're gonna hear about is all things that just have come out since 2006 and going forward. So this is all new information. Since we learned about these changes, a number of studies have been done to try to say, okay, we know the protein that's having the problem. What if we do something to counteract that effect? Like maybe we could give back the normal protein or maybe give another protein that will block the abnormal protein. So it's unleashed an amazing amount of research looking into this area. I'm just gonna pick one example because there are many, there are many that are being studied right now. Apellus Pharma is a company that's working on an inhibitor of complement C3. So C3 was one of the proteins in that pathway that I just showed you on that big diagram. By binding it, it inhibits that cascade of inflammation. So the idea is if we can stop that inflammation, that 
pathway from going from top to bottom, if we can put a stop on it from being abnormally activated, that maybe we can slow down the rate that this thinning of the retina causes. So this is now in the phase three studies, and we're gonna find out if that is in fact the case, if we can in fact stop that progression. In the phase two studies, they showed that the rate of this thinning was slowed. And these were small number of patients, so we really can't make a conclusion based on this, but it was very promising. And so basically what we're asking this medication to do is, you see that big cookie cutter? Well, it started out as a tiny little circle of thinning in the retina. And then over the years, it gradually expanded to be that large circle. So for the people who have dry macular degeneration, they don't have any bleeding. If we can slow down this thinning, that will give them more years of useful vision. And that's what this drug is hoping, hoping to do, APL2. So those studies are ongoing. Hopefully that will help us. Another way of trying to slow this down might be giving a chemical that actually helps those seeing cells live longer. Like let's say it's a growth factor that helps retinal cells live longer, for example. Well, that might be something you would want to be going on all the time. And another company, Neurotech, has developed a little implant that has, it's almost like this, what you're looking at, this um, oblong shaped implant has cells inside of it. And these cells can be programmed to make whatever you want them to make. So this would apply for many different things. In this case, what we're talking about is maybe having those cells make a growth factor for nerve tissue or for retinal cells. So they might be able to stimulate the retina to help those cells that are dying, to help them live longer, help them not have the effects of that thinning. So you can imagine, you could make this to produce any kind of uh, protein in the eye. So this would be something that would be injected as a one-time thing, and it might last for years where these cells just keep producing this desired protein that helps counteract the effect of the macular degeneration. So studies are underway with this as well. Another area, stem cells. So stem cells are cells that are early in their development in terms of what they're going to come to be. So these are cells that can be programmed to become what we want them to become. If we give them the right nutrients, put them in the right environment, give them the right chemical stimulants, they can develop into being whatever we want them to be. Well, what if we did stem cells for those RPE cells, those cells that are the ones that are dying and making that cookie cutter thinning that then causes the retinal cells on top of them to die? What if we could give back the healthy cells in a mosaic that looks like this and so that those retinal cells sitting on top of those helper cells, those retinal cells can get their nutrients again. They can get their things recycled. They can keep their vision going. So stem cells is a huge area of research for macular degeneration. There's a number of ways that this could be done. So here you're looking at a cutout of an eye and you're seeing the lens in the front of the eye. You're seeing the orangey retina in the back of the eye. You're seeing the blood vessels in the retina. And you see this long probe here, just a very, very thin needle. And this is a procedure that would be done in surgery. And it would be in order to inject these cells underneath the retina into the macula. So you're trying to repopulate that area where all those cells are missing. Research like this is going on. What's another strategy? Another strategy was maybe, maybe we don't have to actually inject it under the retina. I mean, that's more risky. It's a, it's a surgery. There's other things that could happen. You get a detached retina. Maybe if we just inject the cells into the eye, those cells can make the products that we want to help the retina live longer. So we could program these cells to make something and just inject them into the retina. Another strategy that's being looked at is instead of just injecting these cells as just a, a slurry, just a, a big group of these cells in fluid, what if we put those cells onto a platform? We could make a very, very thin, 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 thin layer platform and make a sheet of these cells and do a surgery and insert this sheet of cells under the retina to repopulate that whole missing circle, that whole cookie cutter area that's missing. Let's insert a sheet of cells 
perfectly oriented. So the top is where the top should be, the bottom is where the bottom should be, perfectly oriented and, inject, and insert that under the retina and let those cells start living. So all three of those strategies are ongoing right now. No one knows which is gonna be the one that's gonna work the best, no one knows. As far as injecting them under the retina, there was a lot of concern because you just don't know, like when you're injecting a cell that has the ability to start dividing, we don't know if those cells are just gonna keep on growing forever or whether they are going to stop at some point on their own or whether they will um, maybe even cause a tumor, you know? So in the initial evaluations were encouraging. There was no signs of a tumor growth. There were no patients who had severe vision loss. The long-term results, this is an area that's just been taking a while. It's, it's we really don't have good long-term results yet. So I would say about this is this is encouraging. This is probably going to be a strategy. Like one of these ways probably will be what we will be doing for people with dry AMD in the future. But at the moment, I would say it's not, it's certainly not at the level where we want to be just treating patients. And you may have heard about some of these clinics where um, they were treating patients with stem cells for macular degeneration. Some of those patients went blind from retinal detachments and torn retinas because the cells were just growing on, on top of the retina. It wasn't a very regulated treatment. In general, what I would tell you is if you hear about studies regarding this, the one red flag would be you shouldn't have to pay to be in the study. If you're paying a fee to be in the study, then just be very cautious. Be very, uh, you know, seek out the advice of other, your, your, your primary retina doctor that you've been going to for years and get other people's advice about a study that you would have to pay to participate in because most of the studies that are being done to really understand this and understand if it's going to be helpful, most of these studies, you are a participant and, it, and everything is funded for you. You're not having to pay to be part of the study. So it's just my personal opinion, my recommendation. But yes, these studies are going on, but we really don't know what is the best way yet to use stem cells for macular degeneration. So now on the wet side, so wet AMD. So we talked about, you know, we've got these drugs, we've got these treatments, so why are we still researching wet AMD? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, you know, some people need to have the injection every four to six weeks forever because their blood vessels just keep coming back once the medicine wears off. Other people, like we said, there's this variability in macular degeneration. Other people get their injection. They maybe in the first year, they're getting it every five or six weeks, and then they start spreading it out where they're getting once every two months and once every three months. And, and that's a very reasonable kind of pattern. But for many people, it's not that reasonable. Some people need to have the injection every four to six weeks. And certainly I would say that's worth it. I mean, it helps you keep your vision. I mean, I have patients who, are in their 90s and they're still driving and they have wet AMD. Their vision's 20, 20, 20, 30, 20, 40. And, but they need to get these injections on a regular basis or they see their vision start to decline. So if we could de design a medicine that maybe would last longer in the eye so that you don't have to have as many injections, or let's say there were a way to block the chemical even better or maybe block another pathway because we have other patients where the medicines just don't seem to work that great. You know, no matter what we do, they still have fluid in their retina. Maybe there would be a way that we could uh, block that even better if we developed another treatment. So even in the area of wet AMD where we do have treatments, there still is research going on to try to make those treatments better. We're going to talk about it, about one of these in a little more detail. It's called Bayavu. It was just approved about a year ago, October 2019. And, um, and then there's Allergan has its um, medication that's in development. And there are other companies that have other medications in development. So let's just talk about Bayavu. So we talked about that right now we have basically Lucentis or Ranibizumab. We have a Flibersept which is uh, ILEA, and we have Bevacizumab or Avastin, which is being used off-label. Brolucizumab or Bayovu is a molecule that's smaller than these other ones. And because of that, we can pack more molecules in a milliliter of solution. 
So we're injecting a very small amount of solution into someone's eye. It's a half of a tenth of a milliliter, very small amount. If we can pack more molecules into that small amount of fluid, maybe we can get longer activity and not have to have as many injections. So that was the theory for this medication, brolicizumab. Well, what they found in their studies is that th this was dramatic. I mean, the people who could get an injection every 12 weeks was about 50%. So half of the patients could go 12 weeks after they had their initial loading dose of getting one every, every month for three months, about half of the people could go 12 weeks and, and just getting their one injection every 12 weeks. So that's, that's a dramatic step forward. Like there's nothing you can say about that that's controversial. I mean, that is a step forward. Um, in terms of the visual results, this graph is just showing how people's vision responded and in this study, it was comparing brolicizumab or Bevu to a flibercept or ILEA. And if you look, this is um, on the bottom of the graph is time. So you have weeks going out, four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks. And then on the left side of the graph are letters on the chart. So if someone's going upward, that means they're gaining letters on the chart. And then we have the, the different doses of Bevu and we have the a flibercept or ILEA. And, and you can see basically all the different groups all did about the same. So the point with that is to say that these patients were maintaining the same vision as other patients getting injections, say every eight weeks, they were getting injections once every 12 weeks and they maintained essentially the same level of vision and had fewer injections all year long. Another thing that they noticed, remember those OCT scans that we talked about, those scans that your doctor will do and you could see that fluid under the retina. What they found is they were better able to get rid of that fluid using Bayouvu than they were with ILEA. So that was another, you know, that, that's definitely a positive. Now the issue is that once the medicine was, was released and, and actually this was seen in the studies also, is that some people get inflammation from the medicine. So if you look overall, like any kind of inflammation, just a little irritation, maybe some cells floating in the eye that are response, your immune system is reacting to the medicine. About 4% of people had any kind of inflammation compared to 1% of the patients receiving a flibercept. And then some severe reactions, maybe eight, nine, 10 people out of 10,000. So it's a small number, but it's real if it's you. Um, it, they had severe inflammation causing vasculitis, so inflammation of the retinal blood vessels. Some people even had an occlusion of the retinal blood vessels and they ended up with severe vision loss. So this makes it very, very challenging because unfortunately there's no way to know ahead of time which person is likely to have this kind of reaction. So, you know, it's just been a year, you know, in October of last year, it has been one year that this medicine has been available to us to use. So most retina doctors have decided to use this as their kind of their, um, their backstop. Like this is my medicine that I go to if everything else is not working. I've tried Lucentis, I've tried Ilea, I've tried Avastin and there's still fluid. I can't go longer than four weeks. And we have a discussion with the patients. Like there's, there's a chance you may get some level of inflammation. We can just treat it with eye drops and you'll be fine. It might be a mild inflammation and then we'll just decide we're not gonna use it. Or you could be one of the rare people that gets a very severe inflammatory reaction. You might even lose vision if you have that severe reaction. Happens maybe eight or 10 people out of 10,000, but that means there's some people who are gonna have that reaction and that could be you. And as long as everybody's aware and everybody's understanding the risk, um, you know, I have patients who are taking Bayavu and they are very happy because I could not get them off of their five or six week schedule. Now we're going out two months, two and a half months and they're not, and the leakage is not coming back. So clearly the medication does work, but you're taking some risk. And, um, and the risk is, that's the hard part is that we can't 
look at you ahead of time and say, oh, you're one of the people that's likely to have this problem. They're doing multiple different analyses right now, looking at, um, you know, what are the types of patients? Like, did they have any other autoimmune conditions or was there something that predisposed it? The only thing that has come out at all is that sometimes on their visit before, like say, say they had their first beta blue injection and they're coming back for their second one and there's a little bit of inflammation going on inside their eye. I mean, that can be a warning sign that someone having inflammation after getting one of their injections. And it's not just like the inflammation that you might get from your injection where your eye feels a little red or your eye feels scratchy for a day or two. It's more like a more lingering inflammation where your eye is more light sensitive. It's, it might be tender. And the, the doctor looking in your eye will see cells floating in the eye. These are immune cells, white blood cells floating in the eye. If we see any sign of that, then we should not give another injection. But that's about the only warning signal we get. Like there's nothing that we can use to tell us who's gonna have this severe reaction. So, so that's the challenge with this medicine. But, uh, but it definitely is a step forward. So that's what I will say. Let's talk about another strategy. So another strategy of how we can get this to last longer is if we put a little port in the eye. And this is called the port delivery system. So this is this tiny little port. And you can see on these images under B, C, and D, you see the person's dilated eye here. So it's nothing that someone looking at you is going to see. It's up underneath the eyelid. When you look to the center of their pupil here, when they have them look to the side, you can kind of see this little, little plastic thing here in the edge of the pupil. And then let's look further. And we're going to have them look down. And you can see this little device here. So this is inserted in surgery. So it's a short surgery where the tissue covering of the eye is peeled back and this device is inserted into the eye and then stitched into place and then that tissue covering of the eye is put back into place over it so it's covered so it's not like there's a raw edge of something rubbing on the inside of your eyelid it's covered and um, and so this port is filled with the medicine you can see up here this is a silicone coating this whole thing is filled with the medication and this is slowly released through this end port here. So you get a little bit of that medicine released gradually for months. So the amazing thing with this is that the median time, that means half of the people needed it sooner, but half of it needed it later. The median time to when they had to have this refilled was 15 months. Like, wouldn't that be amazing if you get one injection and it's going to last you for 15 months? Of course, it's not everybody. Some people needed it sooner, but maybe you might need it in six months. Even that would be a step forward. Um, so, and then you can see here, 80% of the patients went six months or more without needing the implant refilled. So that's another strategy. This has its own risk because this is a surgery and you do have a piece of, you know, you have a device sewn into your eye. So there's a risk of that. But certainly, you know, as people are getting older and living longer, and if you're getting your macular degeneration kind of in the later period in your life, and, you know, this, this is certainly going to be an option, certainly going to be an option for someone where it's difficult coming in for multiple visits. And, and so this one is also in its phase three studies. So we'll be hearing about this very soon. Now, it's always important, I always like to mention, you know, there are some times where you'll hear about something that gets presented in a, in a seminar like this, and then you don't hear anything about it all of a sudden, because not everything works. You know, there were two very, very promising medications, one by Optotech and one by Regeneron, where a lot of money was spent, a lot of patients were studied, and it just turned out that it didn't work. It didn't hurt anything. It wasn't a bad thing, but adding an extra medicine to their regular treatment did not actually improve the efficiency or efficacy of the medicine. So unfortunately, some of these studies don't turn out. And we always have to remember that. Like if you're gonna be a part of a study and I do studies in my office also, and I enjoy it, it's exciting. But remember that not every study does turn out to be a benefit. So that, that does happen. There's another one, which is called Farsimab, which is another medication. Um, which has basically blocks two chemicals at once. So kind of that strategy we were talking about with the previous ones, which didn't work. Well, this is blocking two different, well, one of them is the same and the other one is blocking a different chemical. 
And so this one injection has a molecule that blocks two different chemicals at the same time. So that's exciting because maybe if we're blocking two different chemicals that are both in the pathway of making these abnormal blood vessels, maybe they will stop more efficiently. Maybe they won't need as many injections. Maybe the effect will last longer. So we are very interested. This is also in phase two, going to phase three. Um, so these are progressing along. So these studies are all progressing along. Now let's talk about a whole new different strategy, whole new different way of doing it, gene therapy. So there's a lot of excitement about gene therapy because ophthalmology was the first disease where we were able to show and get FDA approval for a medication to reverse a genetic disease. And that disease is called labor congenital amaurosis. And it's a disease that affects young children. They are blind or nearly blind from birth where they have very limited vision. They're, they're not completely in the dark blind, but they would have difficulty following a maze on the floor if you put out a maze and ask them to walk along this pathway. And they found, figured out what the gene is that causes their condition. They were able to manufacture that gene put it into a virus. So a virus that would be like a cold virus. In the laboratory, the DNA or the, the, the instructions for that virus are taken out. All those instructions that makes that virus give you a cold, they take that out. So you get no symptoms of having a cold if you get exposed to this virus at this time because all of those instructions of how the virus does that, its DNA, its genes are taken out. And instead, we put in the gene that replaces that abnormal gene for labor's congenital amaurosis. And they were able to show that when they inject that gene using this virus as the way to get it into the cell, that's why we're using the virus, by the way, is because we need a way to get that gene into a cell. It can't just be floating, something that you would swallow and, and it's going to get into all your cells. No, we need a way to get it into the cell. So they use a virus because viruses know how to get into cells. But the difference is instead of injecting the instructions of how to give you a cold, it's going to inject the instructions of how to repair that abnormal gene. And they actually showed that these children are now able to see where they can walk along a pathway if you make a maze on the ground. They can see the edge of the sidewalk versus the road. Um, so much more functional vision. And that's, that's proven, that's already done, it's being done now. Patients can get that treatment if they have that type of condition. Well, what if instead of putting that gene for labor's congenital amaurosis, what if we put in a gene that helps you make ILEA, let's say, for example, or Lucentis or Brolicizumab. Let's put that gene into the virus and the virus will put that gene into retinal cells and those cells will make, they will manufacture on their own, their own ILEA, let's say. Well, and that's kind of the summary of this. And so that now the cells in the retina are making that protein. So we don't need injections if that works well and it can, if it can make enough of that protein, we might not need injections at all. So Adverum is one of the companies, there are others and kind of for each of these areas, I'm picking one just to make it simple and to not overload this presentation, Adverum is one, and they're basically doing that. They're injecting the sequence for a flibercept or ILEA. It's a one-time injection. They've proven that when they do this, they've done this in non-human primate, primates, and what happens is the photoreceptors, the ganglion cells, the, all these cells in the retina, even cells in the optic nerve, and even cells in the iris start making ILEA. So you have the medicine being made inside your eye after just one injection. So this is a slide from Dr. Arshad Kanani's presentation and just showing you the virus and the aflibercept signal that's being put into this uh, virus right here and then showing how the virus deposits that into the cell and then your own cell starts to make the aflibercept. And so there's constantly going to be a low level of aflibercept being made inside the cell. So their phase one studies were very promising. People going months and months and months without needing an injection. This is going to go on further. I mean, you're going to be hearing about this strategy 
and, and further results. So this is, this is one that you will be hearing about more in the future. Okay, so what's the future on trying to identify people who are at risk for this? Because that's the big thing, you know, the earlier we catch it, remember we saw that big scar in the beginning where that's someone who never got treatment. Well, the earlier we treat this, the smaller the scar, the better the visual outcome. There's, it's been proven in study after study after study is the earlier you get treated, the less impact this will have on your vision. What we usually do now is we ask patients to monitor their vision. We give them a grid, it's called the Amsler grid. It has little, it's almost like a piece of graph paper, has little squares. And we ask them to call us if they start to notice the, the squares getting distorted. And we see them on regular intervals to watch them. And depending on what risk they are, we might see them more frequently or less frequently. But in that period between your eye visits, you're, it's kind of up to you to be able to be on the lookout for something changing. Um, 4C, Notel Vision, has made a device that makes this easier, makes it less monotonous, makes it a little more fun, makes it something that you're willing to do versus just looking at a piece of graph paper every day and wondering, is that little waviness, is that real or is that not real? Or did I see that yesterday or I didn't see that yesterday? This is just another way. And you're going to hear a whole presentation about this by Dr. Blemker, and uh, she's up next. And so I'm not going to give you too many um, details about it. But bottom line is when you make, you start making more errors using this little test that takes about five minutes for each eye, your doctor gets a report saying, Mrs. Jones is starting to make more errors on this test. You should have her come in for an exam. And so we might get you in in the middle of your six month period. We might be calling you in at three months because you're starting to make more errors. And so this is definitely going to be, devices like this are going to be the future of how we monitor because it's just so much more effective about about identifying people early. What's the future for those people that have already lost their vision? You know, um, one strategy is a retinal implant. This is a device that would be inserted in the retina that would respond to light. Most of these devices have a camera that you'd wear and it's sending a signal to that implant and the implant is stimulating the healthy retina around there or it might even be an implant that goes back to the brain, you know, kind of like those cochlear implants you, you see for people who are deaf. What if we made the implant go all the way back to the visual cortex, the part of the brain that does vision, and we stimulated the brain back there for someone who doesn't really have useful vision in their eyes? You know, so all of these strategies are being worked on. There is one implant that is, uh, that has been manufactured and, uh, was in place. Um, the company kind of put that on hold. And so, um, so we'll, we will see where this is going to go. Other companies will probably come in to take this technology further. But this is for people who have severe vision loss who have lost their vision. What's another way of getting around that scar tissue in the retina? Another way is an implantable miniature telescope, a little telescope that would magnify the image so that the spot on your retina is a smaller part of what you're seeing than what it was before. So let me just give you an image of that. So here's the little implant. It goes into the eye in the place where your normal lens implant would be after cataract surgery. So a cataract is removed and this implant goes into the eye and it sits there. You can see it in this lower diagram where it's sitting right here behind the person's pupil. We're looking at a cutaway view of the eye and the front of the eye is up here. This is the cornea in the front of the eye. So light's coming in this way and there's this implant right here that's like a telescope. So what does it do? You can see when you're looking at the person, you can kind of see the shimmer or the reflection of that implant in the center of their pupil. When the person is looking at something, so this is kind of a diagram showing how that word cap is falling on the person's blind spot. So the whole word is missing in that upper left picture. In the lower left picture, you're seeing what happens if you magnify that. So it's like a telescope. And so now that circular area of missing retina is a smaller part of the overall image. So now we've magnified the C and the T and the A is only partially blocked. So the person gets more vision. They might be able to recognize that that is the word cat now, whereas before it was just a blank space. This is challenging, you know. 
it's challenging for the patient to adapt to it because it's kind of like walking around with binoculars on. It would be a binocular on one eye and regular vision on the other eye. So this is basically for a person who has very poor vision in both eyes. Both eyes have to have poor vision. And it has to be someone who has a positive attitude, like someone who's willing to learn new things, someone who's willing to take the time that this is going to take to adjust to it. But there are patients who do find it very helpful. But maybe out of every person, maybe a third of people would really be a good candidate because they could adapt to that sense of having two different sides of vision, you know, one eye seeing something different from the other eye and being able to adapt to that. So what do you do? What do you do if you have lost vision? You know, not everybody responds the same to these medicines. Some people have the dry form and they lose vision even though um, there's nothing leaking or bleeding in their retina. They're just getting that thinning that's gradually uh, progressing. One thing I really encourage my patients to do is to go to a low vision clinic. Every city has one. Find out um, what's out there. What are things that you can use to help you enhance the vision that you do have? And you'd be surprised. I mean, you may be still seeing pretty well. You might be say 2070 or 2060. And there are things even at that level of vision that may help certain things in your life be easier to do. Realize that people do get depression from losing vision. That's not abnormal. You may not know anyone who's going through that, but that is, that is a normal response to the concerns of losing your vision. So if there are support groups in their area, people will get together and talk about how do they handle this? What do they do when they're at the airport and they can't read the sign? How do they handle you know, all the things of daily life? Try to get to a support group. Maybe go talk with someone every other month and sit around and talk about what you're going through. It really helps stave off the depression. And also talk with your doctor. Maybe you are at the stage where you should be on an antidepressive medication to keep your spirits up a little bit. And then register for disability. There are programs. Texas has the, the Texas Workforce Commission for people who are still wanting to work. They will provide things to help them do the job that they want to do. Every state is different. There may be things available for you. So don't just um, withdraw into yourself. Reach out. There are things out there to help you when you've lost your vision. So to kind of summarize, we talked about a lot today and, and uh, talked about preventing blindness in wet and dry and knowing the differences, talked about the imaging and the devices that we use to better understand the disease. We're learning about the genetics and learning about why every patient is not the same and why patients don't respond the same way and why some people get wet AMD and some people don't. There's a lot that's underlying what is macular degeneration. So, so don't be surprised if your neighbor if your neighbor, maybe they get their injections once every four months and they're doing great. And why am I having to go back every four or five weeks? Well, yours is not exactly the same as your neighbor. And it's not one condition. Our goal is to try to find the best treatment that we can for each patient. And it's not gonna be the same for each patient necessarily. Then lastly, once we've got this damaged retina, what can we do? Is it gonna be stem cells? Is it gonna be a sheet of cells that we put into the retina? Maybe it's gonna be growth factors. Maybe we'll have a growth factor that's constantly being released inside the eye to help those dying cells live longer. So many things are happening. And I, I really wanna leave you with the idea that this is an exciting time. You know, macular degeneration is a severe condition. It's the number one cause of blindness for people over age 65, but there is a lot going on and it's, and it's really, we're gonna see more changes in the, last, in the next 10 years than we've seen in the previous 50 years. You know, it's, it's really an exciting time. So thank you very much. If you do have questions, um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we would, rather than raising your hand and, and trying to get our attention, if you could type it in on the Q&A, and I'm gonna start going through those right now. Um, so one person asked, is this um, based, you know, the information being provided, is it in the United States or is it also in Canada? This, these researchers that get together and we, we talk and we discuss this, this is, this is worldwide, you know, so many of the things that you're hearing about 
even the studies that are being done, even the studies that get FDA approval, you'll have a US surgery, a US study, and then will be a, a outside US study. So these things that we're talking about are, are going on worldwide. So one person asked, if, if, you're, if you're going to your annual checkups with an ophthalmology, would, it, would they be able to find if you're developing the scarring? And, um, and the second question is, if you've been diagnosed with wet AMD, is there any benefit to having genetic testing? So number one, for depending on your stage of your macular degeneration, your doctor may decide, you know, once a year is fine if they just see a few drusen, you may decide that six months, if they start to seeing pigment changes and clumping, we know that those patients are more likely to get wet macular degeneration, then they might start to say, okay, I think we should see you every four to six months. So your doctor will kind of gauge that based on your level of macular degeneration. But really exactly what you're thinking is that, you know, once a year really isn't that much. And if you start getting the wet form two months into your one year, I mean, that's, you're going to have symptoms before it's time for your next appointment. So you need to be looking out for these changes. And that's, you know, the AMSR grid, no television is going to give their presentation. We need to be looking for this in between those visits. And then in terms of once you've been diagnosed with wet AMD, it's kind of the same question as if I've been diagnosed with wet AMD, should I still take the vitamins? So if, if one of your eyes is still dry, then yeah, I would still take the vitamins because the vitamins may help slow the progression in the dry AMD eye. In terms of genetic testing, if you have the wet form, you really don't need to have the genetic testing because we already know like what the genetics are telling us is what is this person's risk of going on to the severe form? So if you already are at the severe form, we already know you are one of the ones that are. So basically you don't need to have genetic testing if you already have um, wet AMD. Another question, can cataracts cause scar tissue or, or make dry AMD worse? Um, we really don't think that the cataract surgery can make the dry AMD worse. But the one thing we should say is that for everyone, you want, as far as one of those protective things, like we talked about green leafy vegetables and having some fish and all that, you should also protect your eyes from UV light. Now there's a question about maybe that after cataract surgery, maybe you're getting more UV light exposure than through your own natural lens. So bottom line, when you're outdoors, wear UV light protection. When you're buying sunglasses, it must say on the sunglasses that it blocks all UVA and UVB light. Because if it doesn't have that tag on it, then they are not blocking that light. The sunglasses do not have to be dark. They can be those light amber yellow sunglasses. Those will give you more contrast but it must block UV light or else it's not doing the good for you. So if you're, if you're wearing sunglasses outside, I would say cataract surgery is not going to make your dry AMD worse. As far as whether it could make you more likely to get wet AMD, that's a debatable topic. Large studies with thousands of patients where they do epidemiologic studies, they have shown that if there is an effect, it is a very, very small. So you'll have a big study come out and it shows no effect from having cataract surgery. Then you'll have another one that shows a very small effect. So my take on that is that if there is an effect, it is a very small effect that it just may be perhaps the inflammation of surgery or something about surgery itself might slightly increase the risk of going to wet. But even if there is a risk, which it might not be because some studies say there is no risk, even if there is a risk, it's very, very small. So I would encourage if, if your cataracts are beginning to affect your daily life, where you're giving up things and things that you can't do um, because of your cataracts, and, and it's felt that that isn't meaningful, then I would have the cataract surgery. I would encourage you to have your cataract surgery so you can function better in your daily life. So one person asked about oral medications, and really there, there are no other oral medications other than the AREDS vitamins. And you know, these, all these chemical pathways that we're talking about are very important pathways. Like we would not want to block your VEGF in your whole body. Like we wouldn't want to make an anti-VEGF pill that you would take because if you break your leg, if you have a heart attack, our bodies need VEGF to have the blood vessels come in and heal that wound. So your body uses that growth factor all the time, but it's just when it's abnormally high in a place where it shouldn't be, like in your retina, that's when it's a problem. So 
many of these, even the complement pathway, where we're talking about for dry AMD, you wouldn't want to block complement in your whole body if you don't have to. Like if the condition is something that's not affecting your whole body, we want that effect to just happen in the eye. So that's why you hear about all of these medications being directed to the eye only, because we don't want side effects happening in the rest of the body. Let's see, what else, what other questions we have here? Um, if you have AMD, one question that says, if you have wet AMD, do you need to see a retina specialist, ophthalmologist, and an optometrist? So, you know, as you can tell from everything you heard, and that's cutting the tip of this, this is a complicated field. I mean, there's a lot of decisions to be made. Most of the time, if you live in an area where a retina specialist is, a, is available, you're going to have people who know who are kind of at the top of their field on this topic if you go to a wet macular degenerative, if you go to a, uh, a retina specialist. You know, we, we all can't keep up on everything. I don't know what the best lens implant is to tell you to get when you have your cataract surgery. I keep up on this. This is what I keep up on. So really, yes, you if you have wet AMD, you should, you should ideally see a retina specialist. Now, an optometrist is still going to need to be part of it because you may need updates for your glasses. So you'll still see your optometrist. Your general ophthalmologist may still be a part of it. They may be monitoring you because you're at risk for getting glaucoma, or that's the person that's going to do your cataract surgery it would be your, your comprehensive ophthalmologist. So you might end up having three different eye doctors that you go to um, for a period of time, but, um, but you know, that's how specialized things have become. So. So another person asked, like, if you have wet AMD, is there a correlation to having more trouble if you work on a computer or you do, you're on screens or looking at your phone a lot? Um, so um, I would say that definitely to not worry about using your computer, using your phone or, or any of those things making your wet macular degeneration worse or making it so that you're more likely to progress from dry to wet. No, that doesn't. That won't happen. You can use your screens as much as you want. You might get eye strain. Your eyes may feel tired and your eyes may, may get dry. So I encourage patients, you know, anyone who has blurred vision, you may notice that when you're struggling, when you're trying to read or see, your eyes dry out. And why is that? Because you don't blink as much. When you're really concentrating, you tend not to blink as much. So your eyes get dry. So if you're doing detailed work on the computer, you're on your phone a lot, use artificial tears. But no, you do not have to worry about the, that causing you to progress. One person asked, how do you get into these studies? There's a great website. So one first thing, one great resource is your doctor that you go to. Ask them, do they participate in studies? Are there people in your city who participate in studies? Ask the doctor that you go to if they're aware of that. Second place, there's a place called clinicaltrials.gov. It's a place where all these clinical trials get listed and you can search. You can search based on what your condition is. You can search based on location and it'll be a huge long list and then just start looking through that list. And it lists all the studies, who's doing them, where they're located. There's a phone number, there's an email. You can send an email, see if they're recruiting at this time. Um, uh, so, that, that's, that's what I would say. And then the last question, because I'm running into the next speaker's time. Um, uh, let's see, I, I, I'm gonna kind of answer two questions at once. So one is about cataract surgery and one is about eye pressure being elevated. So um, there is not an issue, once again, about cataract surgery. They, they were talking about a specific condition, like a person who has leukemia, and they also need to have cataract surgery, should they be worried about their dry AMD progressing? And I would say, like we said before, if there is a risk, it is extremely small. And I would say if the cataracts are affecting your daily life, please go ahead and have your cataract surgery so you can function better because the risk is probably very low that the cataract would cause you to um, progress. And the other one was about glaucoma. Person said that my pressure is 21 to 22 all the time. Is that gonna make my macular degeneration progress? No, that there's no evidence that having uh, borderline ocular hypertension or even glaucoma makes you more likely to get wet AMD. So thank you very much. I enjoyed speaking with you and um, enjoy the rest of the program. Well, I want to thank Dr. Brown. That's probably one of the most interesting presentations that you'll hear. Uh, the future is bright. Uh, for those of you that have already lost some vision, uh, I can say that low vision therapy is very important. 
Dr. Blunker is an ocular disease residency uh, trained optometrist who practices in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, she was a clinical executive outcome specialist with Bosch and Loam uh, for four years prior to joining Notovision. A little over two years ago, where she serves as Director of Clinical Affairs and Professional Relations. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. Megan Klemker. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate the introduction. And thank you all so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. It is such a privilege to be here, and we are so proud to partner with the Macular Degeneration Association. And I'd like to reiter reiterate some of the very important points that Dr. Brown made in his wonderful presentation. And we're going to further discuss understanding the importance of early detection of wet AMD and how you can play a role in protecting your vision. So 4C Home AMD monitoring program is actually an FDA cleared and Medicare covered device. It's prescribed by your eye care provider when you have the appropriate level of vision, appropriate visual acuity, and the appropriate stage of age-related macular degeneration. And it's a form of personalized medicine with the device being used at home in between your regular eye exams with your doctor. And the way it works is actually to detect metamorphopsia or visual distortions in age-related macular degeneration. And as Dr. Brown beautifully described, there are two types of AMD, dry and wet. And AMD is the leading cause of severe central vision loss in people over the age of 50 years in the United States. And I'll share with you the information you need to, to get informed and to take charge of your vision. So as we've learned, AMD is a chronic, meaning it does not resolve, it does not go away, and progressive, which means it tends to worsen over time type of condition. And dry AMD is the slower changing or earlier form of the disease that puts you at risk for developing wet AMD, while wet AMD is that sudden change or more advanced form of the disease. It affects the area of the retina called the macula, which is responsible for your detailed central vision. And you use this vision for activities like reading, driving, seeing faces clearly, and as we have discussed in Dr. Brown's presentation, in dry AMD, changes occur in this macula in the form of drusen or deposits, which build up in the area. And some of these changes will uh, take place in your vision, can include blurry vision. You can't see sh uh, sharp details, both up close and from a distance. And again, since the dry form is a slow form of the disease, sometimes you may not notice these changes over time. And more importantly, like we'd said, dry AMD puts you at that increased risk of progressing to the wet form of AMD. And so as these deposits over time increase in size and number, this will increase your risk of developing that wet AMD. And again, this change can be sudden, it can be without any kind of advance notice, and what's happening is if you convert to wet AMD, those abnormal blood vessels are actually growing into the retina, into that macula area, and they'll leak fluid and sometimes they can bleed again without any kind of warning. So you may not notice these changes until significant vision loss has already occurred. Again, as we said, it could be rapid and severe. And if you convert um, symptoms can include distortion, straight lines look wavy, dark spots appear in the center of your vision, and just generalized blurry vision. So you can actually play a role in protecting your vision through at-home monitoring. And the 4C Home is the device that's pictured here on the left side of your screen. So you use this at home in between your regular doctor's visits and it helps people with dry AMD to detect wet AMD before you even notice that any changes may have taken place. And so how does it work exactly? Well, you take a simple daily test. It checks for tiny changes in your vision and it takes about three minutes per eye per day. That data from each test is sent to your eye doctor and the no Vision Diagnostic Clinic which is our medical provider of 4C Home. And then if a change in the test, or, test scores is detected, that no television diagnostic clinic actually alerts your doctor. So your doctor's office will then contact you directly to schedule a follow-up visit. 
Dr. Brown also mentioned the AMSR grid, which is this grid or this piece of paper with the lines that you'll see over here on the left side of your screen. And it was developed in the 1940s and it's for a long time been recommended as a very simple and accessible tool that you can use from home to monitor for changes in your vision. But however, by the time you notice vision distortions on the grid, sometimes significant vision loss could have occurred. So fortunately, we have our new technology, the 4C Home AMD Monitoring Program, the device you can see over here on the right side of the screen, which has been developed to actually detect those tiny changes before symptoms are noticed, and you can report them to your doctor so you can receive immediate treatment. The testing with 4C Home is very easy. You simply turn the device on, and then you look into the viewfinder to begin the testing. So that's a picture on the left side of your screen here of the three photos. And then you take an easy test where you'll see a center dot in your vision. That's this green circle here in the middle. And a bump will briefly appear and then disappear. And the idea is that you use the mouse that's provided to actually click where the bump appeared, and then you return to the center dot. So after that, your results are sent from each test to the no Vision Diagnostic Clinic for evaluation, and then they're provided to your eye doctor. And this is something that you can do regularly. So at-home monitoring is like any other daily healthy habit that you have, like brushing your teeth. And so it's very good to help preserve your vision just doing this on a regular basis every day. 4C Home actually allows you to take a proactive approach to protecting your vision. So a clinical partner will be with you every step of the way. And after the no Vision Diagnostic Clinic receives a referral from your doctor, so this has to be prescribed by your eye care professional, by your eye doctor, and we will receive at our no Vision Diagnostic Clinic that referral form, that order form. And our team is actually going to answer any questions that you might have, verify insurance coverage, and then ship the device to you after we have discussed all of that with you and you have agreed to move forward with the program. So once you receive the device, the no Vision Diagnostic Clinic will then walk you through the setup and training. So again, that same team gets back on the phone with you and will be able to help you remotely with the setup and get you comfortable with testing with the device. And then as you're testing regularly, you and your doctor will both continue to receive the feedback from the diagnostic clinic from no Vision. Again, our team is going to verify our insurance benefits and discuss with you prior to accepting the device and prior to getting started with the program, but there are low out-of-pocket costs for Medicare patients. So patients with Medicare and a secondary supplement plan could have out-of-pocket costs as low as $0 per month. So no payment per month, depending on your coverage. And patients with Medicare and no secondary supplement plan, there's an average of about $15.03 per month once your yearly Medicare fee for service Part B deductible is met. But again, this is something that our benefits verification team would go over and discuss with you before ever shipping you the device and before you engage in the program. So once your doctor sends the order to our no television diagnostic clinic to begin monitoring with the program, and again, the appropriate candidates have a particular stage of AMD and a particular level of vision. And then you'll continue to test regularly at home and then if that change takes place, then your doctor will be alerted and have you come in for the examination. And the goal, of course, the no Vision Diagnostic Clinic is working with your doctor to remotely monitor your dry AMD. And we want to help you retain functional vision throughout your AMD journey. Thank you. And with that, I will see if there are any questions from the audience. Okay, you need to uh, go to the Q&A at the bottom of your screen to get to, answer, to ask your questions. Perfect, thank I, you. I do have one question though. Yes. If you have uh, wet in one eye and dry in the other eye, should you be testing both eyes with your 4C home? Wonderful question. So we do have patients in this scenario and what happens with the testing is the way the artificial intelligence or the way the technology is taught or learns how to monitor for these changes is for dry intermediate AMD patients. So if you have wet AMD, it's not going to work as well and you should not be testing the eye. So I'll only test one eye if you have one, right. 
Yeah, that's that's the so oftentimes I'll give a two part answer for these wonderful questions because there's the medical reason, like I said, where the device as far as the way it's designed and what it will learn to notice a change for. And then there's also the aspect that uh, insurance will only cover if the patients have intermediate dry AMD if they have dry versus wet. But you bring up your question is actually a great segue to this question that we have here, Larry. Um, I have wet AMD and get ILEA shots in each eye every four to five weeks. Is 4C Home something I should pursue? I understand I can't get shots more often than every four weeks. And the short answer is yes, you'd be a great candidate for 4C Home in the fellow eye, to Larry's point of testing that dry eye. And actually, if you have converted already in one eye, you're at a higher risk, you're in a higher risk group for conversion in that fellow eye to wet AMD. So talk to your doctor about this and see if you're at the appropriate level or stage of AMD and the appropriate level of vision. And because you're in a higher risk category, you, you could potentially be a great candidate for 4C home. Uh, the next question is, is there anything on the horizon for wet AMD to help determine any changes in between visits with your retina specialist? Uh, yes, actually, there are technologies on the horizon. Um, we actually have a technology that is in our pipeline. I'm not able to share too many details as it is investigational. I can't make any claims, but a home OCT or those OCT scans that I know Dr. Brown had discussed and, and you've been able to have done at your doctor's office, that device where it's scanning the back of your eye, looking for fluid, um, developing a technology that would be able to do a personalized at-home version of that, uh, similar to the platform that I just discussed with you for 4C Home. Okay, I just want to uh, thank everybody for attending. Uh, please visit our website for future uh, patient conferences. That's Macular Hope one word, M-A-C-U-L-A-R-H-O-P-E dot O-R-G uh, for future conferences. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Blumker for her presentation. It was, uh, it was very important. So thank you all and stay healthy.